Thank you, Sam. So tonight we're going to have a discussion about keeping and breeding mast finches. Um, I think I've had mast for about 15 years now, and I've got my first birds from Joe Cavill, who's sitting in the front row. And uh, hopefully I've learned a bit since then, but at the outset I'd like to say that what I'm going to say is based on my experience, and I keep my birds in a very small aviary, it's only three metres by two, so I've got to be very careful about overcrowding. And some of the things I'm going to talk about are mistakes I've made. So most of the things I'm going to say you shouldn't do are things that I've done, so I should say that at the outset. So, um, Masks are a beautiful bird, they're very finely feathered, so when you see a quality bird like that one, that's a photo from Ken Wagland in a broken head, so he breeds very good quality birds. And there's a number of masks going around that aren't of great quality, so I think we've just got to be careful about that. So I'll see if I can get the slide. So there's basically two varieties of masks. There's the normal or nominal form, which is the ones on the left, and there's the wide ear mask on the, on the right there. Um, the normal mask is far more widely distributed. It's distributed from the Kimberleys through the Northern Territory into North Queensland, whereas the wide end mask is pretty much confined to Cape York and, and northern parts of Queensland. So, we'll talk a bit about sexing in a while, but you can see from those birds, when you've got a pair together, the subtle differences become clearer. So this is a pair of normal masks, and these are photos I acknowledge from Ken Wagman. And when you look at them, they can look very similar, but there are some very subtle but distinct differences that help you sex them, particularly if you've got a true pair together. And I think, uh, Joe, you can add in anything you like as, you, as we go through. But if you look at the head shape and the neck shape, the cockbird has a bolder head, a sort of a more conical shaped beak that's normally richer yellow in colour. The hen has got a narrower head, like is common with a lot of finch species. Uh, it's got a skinnier neck, and the body colour of the hen is much less rich. And so if you look at the hot bird is on the top, hen bird on the bottom. The rich brown coloration is much stronger in the cockbird. The hen is a sort of a paler version. The trouser stripe, which is the stripe under the wings towards the tail, is normally a richer black and more extensive in the cockbird than the hen. And the tail is a much more lustrous black in the cockbird than the henbird. The henbird is more of a, a dull blackish brownish coloration. So it does help you distinguish. Even the marks, even the marks has a different size. Like yes. The, the, the black mask is normally a bit more extensive and a glossier black in the cockbird than the henbird. So after you, it takes a bit of a practiced eye, but when you get a true pair together, I, I find them easier to sex when you've got two, two birds together than if you've got 20 in a cage, because then you're sort of taking a random, random guess. It's probably the reason a lot of people keep masks as a colony, because they have difficulty sexing them, so they often put them as a colony. But I actually think they're probably a really true colony bird. And of course you can fall back to either Joe helping you sex them or DNA sexing. Stanley's a lot more affordable now. I think you can get DNA sexing for about $10 a bird. So. As I said, there's quite a few masks around from time to time, but they go through booms and busts of popularity. I have not seen a normal mask for sale at any of the bird sales this season. There have been some wide masks from a chap in uh, Gunnada, but the normal masks are becoming quite difficult to find. Uh, and because they're closely related to long tails and black throats, they're from the same genus, they are much more placid bird than the long tails, they're less boisterous, so you should not keep them together with long tails or black throats because they could interbreed, but also because they're not as dominant. Uh, I've found they're a very, very placid species, so you've got to be careful what you house them with. I think, 
just finding out how people that you're buying the birds from, how do they keep them, what do they feed them. I have visited uh, Rodney Burns and say, he's in Gunnedah, on the Gunnedah sale. He feeds copious amounts of white eggs. He breeds heaps of white egg masks. But personally, you may find difficulty breeding them if you go to feed white eggs. So it's a good idea, I think, to find out how, how the birds are kept uh, and follow that regime if you can, because I think you're likely to get better results if you can feed them similar to what the previous owner fed them. One of the things I've found with masks is, and when I bought my four birds from Job, I put them in an all-wire cage and they stressed enormously. The, the next morning they were on the ground, they could not fly. And I thought I was going to lose them. And from that and a bit more research I've learned, keep them in a smaller cage, covered on the back and the sides. And I saw in an article once and I followed it, is to put a wicker nest box, a cane nest box, in the holding cage, put some grass in it, because masks love roosting in a nest. And that really helped them de-stress. So, a bit of spark in the water, some Lebanese cucumber in your carrying box, and, and putting a wicker nest in the holding cage, that they've got something to roost in when you first acquired them, really helps them settle down. So after that, I was sort of not having any problems. Um, housing with compatible species. In my early days I had parrot finches and because I've only got a small aviary, parrot finches that are very vigorous flyers like blue face and red face, they were going crazy around the aviary. The masts just sort of retreated into themselves and sort of were not breeding at all because they were the sort of bottom of the pecking order. Now I only keep yellow rumps and masks and a few stray paintings. So, and they're all quite placid birds. So if you kept them with jarvis or cutthroats or long tails or black throats or parrot finches, maybe the tricolour parrot finches are okay. But unless you've got a big aviary, uh, there's probably a chance that your masks will fall to the bottom of the pecking order. Uh, as I said, my comments apply only to my setup, so people with bigger aviaries or other setups could find their experience is completely different to, to what mine's been. Um, and don't overcrowd. As I said at the start, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are things that I've always done wrong. Like at the start of January this year, in my small aviary, which you'll see in a moment, there were 64 birds. I bought a pair of star finches, which was a mistake. I suddenly had 18 young, so I had 20 starfinches. So I had heaps of orange breasts and painters. So I made the tough decision that I can't afford to house all these species in one aviary and expect to get good breeding results. So I offloaded all my starfinches, all my orange breasts, and most of my painters, except for a few pensioners that deserve a good life to see out their time in my aviary. So, and since since I sold those birds, I rebrushed my aviary on the 5th of March and I've had three of my four pairs of masks go down. Feeding requirements for masks is pretty simple. Good quality finch mix. Um, charcoal is one of the vital ingredients with mask finches. They have a huge love of charcoal. So, excuse my bad photography, but that's, uh, that's a mask finch that's come down to a bowl of charcoal two seconds after I put it in. Small, small amounts of crushed charcoal, they absolutely love it. They put it into their nest, and just big sized pieces that they can pick up, so they crush it up or buy it from the sales table. Um, but they're, of all the finch species, the use of charcoal is sort of predominant. Why they use charcoal is not absolutely known. They think some of the theories are it helps absorb droppings in the nest. Uh, it sort of taints the smell of the young birds, so predators are not able to smell that there's young birds in the nest. Uh, so there's various theories, but if you see the masks, 
with charcoal, you can see how they adore it, so much more so than any other species. It's a terrific mix. I, I have that in my aviary, uh, just a normal finch mix, uh, frozen green seed, and I just put my only live food mealworms in the container over there. So it's a pretty simple regime. The only time my birds have ever touched live food is when they've got down in the nest. So if I put in mealworms, my yellow rumps will have a go at them, irrespective of what time of year. Masks will not touch live food in my ivory until they've got young. And then they just work the mealworm across the bed to suck out the insides. Anyone got any comments or questions? Because I know various people here have... Uh, maggots, the look, small ones. Look, I'm sure, Richard, they go for maggots. Yeah, well... And other people do feed maggots. I'm, yeah, I I'm a lazy person, and so mealworms are simple for me. Yeah. Yeah. Jade, do you feed live food? Okay. Okay. One of my mines got young. I don't see them so often at all. Yeah. They go home and get the seeds, fake seeds, yeah. feed them eggs. Yes. And the eggs, that's about it. Yeah. I, I've had a pair of masks, and we went on holidays overseas for four weeks, and I just had my son feeding them a um, normal pinch mix. Pair went down, raised six young, with no live food, no green food at all. That particular cockbird of that pair finally expired at ten and a half years of age. He was an incredible breeder, bred every year, changed, changed partners quite regularly, so it was a bit promiscuous. But, but he kept, uh, kept, kept them going. So I think uh, ten and a half years was a pretty good lifespan. So basically, the seeding, feeding these are quite simple. So that's a poor photo of my aviary. Uh, so my aviary was built by a guy who built Richard's aviary. And so he didn't believe in shelters. Uh, so I had to modify my aviary to give them a bit more protection. Uh, I have a lot of problems with noisy miners. So I put some shade cloth that you can see to give them a bit of extra protection at the front. Uh, and I can, it's just put on with fasteners that you can buy from Bunnings. So it's easy to pull on and off. Do you want a cure for that? A shotgun? No, no, no. I, I had a situation about three weeks ago where I had noisy miners on my canary cage. Yeah. So I, I had a, um, you know, these fly paper rolls you have? Yeah. I had those in my bird room. I had a few spare ones, so I hung them up outside just near the canary. And one of the miners got caught on it and he was wrapped up in it and I'm trying to bash him. And anyway, in the end, he escaped. He got away. That's a lot of feathers. They have not come down onto any of my cages in the three week tent. Yeah. So I see them fly across the top, but none of them come down. So with a small aviary like that, hang yeah. them down where they go to be. And you might well, I had a situation where in my lawn, in front of the aviary, there was some army worm that was eating into the lawn, and so some of the wild currawongs figured out there was a good feed here. And one of the noisy miners came down and tried to attack the currawongs. The currawongs just went crazy, killed one of the noisy miners, and the noisy miners did not come back for two weeks. Yep. But, but after two weeks, their memory <laughs> faded and they came back. Yep. <laughs> 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 Except I think, I think the Finches were more terrified of the carolongs than the noisy miners. They got used to the noisy miners. The carolongs, that was something different. When they landed on the ocean, they all hell broke loose. Yeah. Um, so I think given the size of my ocean, having it fully roofed is, is preferable. Uh, I have got a few loose pieces of alcinite that's just held together with some angles that I can take off. Um, I think I've found that the mass love, like I've got some rocks in the aviary that surround my water dish, and it sort of replicates what happens in nature, particularly as the dry season approaches in the Kimberleys and that. They come down into the riverbeds, into the rocks, and they hop down into the ponds. And so the masts have 
as a colony some delightful habits. They have communal get-togethers, much chattering. So three or four times a day they'll get together and they all chatter away. They have a distinctive alarm call. So they really do enjoy life as a colony. And so they'll all come down for a bath together. They'll come down onto the largest rock and the smaller rock and then into the water and then they'll all bathe, bathe together. So I have just uh, river sand on the floor um, and, and some grasses growing. Those grasses you can see on the outside, initially they were inside the apiary but then they grew through the wire so they're both outside and inside. But it provides me with plenty of seed, seed and grass heads that I just pluck as so I'm feeding the birds each day. So uh, with, the, with, with them, don't, didn't they even try uh, breeding in the grass itself, in the nests, uh, like build a nest in the grass? I've never had a pair breed in the grass. I've had one pair breed on the ground against the base of the grass. So like under a, like a tussock of grass. But uh, various people I know have had experiences of breeding right on the ground. And I, I've seen a nest in the wild in the Northern Territory, a place called Timber Creek which was up against a tussock of grass. So it was very well disguised, it was yeah. right on the ground. Oh, down low. Yes, yeah. yeah. And interestingly, we had a barbecue campfire at the September Creek place. And the next morning, with just the natural wood that had decayed into charcoal, there was a little colony of masks picking up the charcoal from the fire. <laughs> so, so they do look for charcoal in the wild as well. So, I, I rebrushed my aviary, as I said, on the 5th of March this year after I cleaned out my excess stock. And three of my four pairs of masks have gone to nest. Two are, two are sitting on eggs. The first pair, um, I get this, that's right above my door, that gets the morning sun first thing in the morning. So that's, that's the entrance hole there. Another pair of bread in the cane basket over here with a few helpers up above and another pair of nested uh, down, down the bottom of a, a wire cylinder. Stan, that's your wire cylinders, mate. <laughs> Professionally manufactured by Stan the guest. Those, those wire cylinders. So you just put the brush inside so the wire cylinders is quite a good system. Um, as I said, the colony system versus single pair, you probably do get better results as a single pair, but the colony system, I think, enables the mass to show their true characteristics. They enjoy life as a colony. They're very placid and they have a bit of bickering over territory, like they had a bit of bickering over who got what nest site, and I think the dominant pair got that prime position. But they just settle down after that and don't interfere with anything. Um, one of the important things with masks, I mentioned putting in a, a, a cane nest when you buy a pair in your holding cage when you settle them in, is they do build a roosting nest and they use a roosting nest all year. So I heard of someone who rebrushed their aviary in July in the freezing cold. They pulled out all the brush and rebrushed. They lost quite a few masks because they didn't have any nest boxes or cane nests in their aviary and the masks hadn't had time to build a roosting nest. So I think the timing of when you rebrush is very important. Like I rebrush mine just before the breeding season and the breeding season typically is March to June and then September to November. So rebrushing, I think at the start of March, helped trigger the breeding instinct. And it did help that we had a bit of rain in Sydney as well in that month, but as I said, three of my four pairs have gone down now. And I think it's certainly been helped by the masks now feeling at the top of the pecking order. So the yellow rumps don't cause any problem to any other birds, and painters are a very plastic bird as well. So the masks are now sort of top of the pops, whereas when I had starfinches and the like, they were sort of you know, the more dominant species and the masks had to fit in. So I think 
if you can eliminate some of the stress that masks suffer from, by the way you house them and what species you house them with, probably would yield better results if you've got a small aviary. Like if you've got an aviary like Sam that covers half an acre, <laughs> it's a different story. <laughs> yeah. But I've had them nest in the wire cylinders, the little wire cylinders with a round hole that you can get from Barry Barker, uh, or the, the whipper nest, uh, and I've had one bird nest right on the ground. So, so they will adopt a variety of nesting sites. And I've had the fourth, fourth pair is starting to build a nest down in here. So actually they will nest quite close together. So, once they've sorted out their pecking order, they don't seem to have a problem with, with each other. So, interestingly I found they will only use white chicken feathers to line their nest. So they'll use charcoal. So what I give them, to step back a moment, is I give them some cooch runners to try and build the outer part of the nest because I found if you just use November grass, it's too soft and fragile. And if they nest like that, often the nest is not as solid as some other finch species. It's sort of a bit tenuous, it might fall apart. So if you have a bit of cooch and thicker grasses on the outside, it does help hold them together. Uh, I probably have had better breeding results in cane nests for that reason. That you don't have eggs falling out and you don't have birds getting, if the birds have to be disturbed or leave the nest. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I've noticed for uh, those retired people around is since I've almost stopped working, I still work a couple of days a week, I have a lot more time to spend with the birds. Whereas before when I was working full time, I'd spend five minutes in the morning, seven o'clock, feeding the birds and that was it. Now I've got a lot more time, I was finding I was spending more time going in and out of the aviary. And I had a pair of masks that the hen would come off the nest as soon as she saw me, 20 metres away from the aviary, and would not go back on the nest until I'd left the total vicinity. And I had a few nests where the eggs, I think, just went cold because I was mucking around too much in the aviary and weren't letting them get on with it. So getting to know your birds and how they respond uh, and that's when I had other species in there, so they were probably a bit under stress. Whereas I can go in through the door of the aviary here, and the pair on that, in that nest will just look at me out of the nest. So they're, they're completely different. This other pair were just so spooky that they just got spooked every time I went near the aviary. So it's, it's interesting the difference in individual birds. So, my birds will not use emu feathers at all. They might use some to work, work, weave into the outer lining of the nest, but they will not use emu feathers for lining the nest, whereas most other species love them. So they will only use white chicken feathers. I don't know whether others have had different experience, Joe, or... No, it's fine. Yeah. So the chicken feathers. Yeah. And they're very slow, they're the most frustrating nest builders. They are the slowest nest builder of any finch species. They'll pick up a piece of grass, this is when they're starting off, they'll pick up a piece of grass and they'll manipulate it through their bill, upwards and downwards, and then they'll decide they don't like that piece of grass. So they drop it. And then they'll have a palaver and get together and have much chattering, and then they'll start again. They typically, my birds have a burst of activity from 7 a.m. to 8.30, and then they're on smoko and social activities for a couple of hours. <laughs> and nothing much happens. I had a pair of St. Helena's that I got uh, a few years back uh, from Graham Wagstar. Put them in the aviary. They built a nest from start to finish in a day. The mask just could not believe what was going on. <laughs> they took four weeks to build the same nest. <laughs> But as egg laying approaches, they do get a bit of a move on, and so there's a bit of acceleration. And typically you see those sort of 
typically have all the um, bits of pieces hanging down from the front of the nest. That's a characteristic of the mast nest. Um, I found my birds very hardy once, once they're established. As I said, there's that initial period where they may become stressed. But when they start to group in the morning, they all get together. They might start wagging their little tails in front of the males. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of uh, that happens when they have these communal get togethers. There's t particularly as the breeding season starts, you get the females doing tail quivering and, and the males sort of doing their song and dance up and down. Um, and that, that sort of intensifies as the breeding season approaches. How many pairs do you run in the country? I've got four pairs in there at the moment. And it was probably one pair too many, Ken, but yeah. You know, that's just the way it sort of worked out. So three pairs. I think three pairs is ideal. But do you leave the young there when they're both the nest? Until they're I, I do, yeah. because I find that they roost with the parents or they roost in a separate nest. And I think I would not prove them that when they come out of the nest they've got a black bill. Yeah. And until that black bill turns or is turning yellow, yeah. I would not move them. So you could have it at the end of the breeding season or towards the end like now, you might have 30 birds in there then? Yes, that's right. That's right. So that's one of the downfalls of not having a holding over it. So I'd always recommend that she who must be obeyed uh, took a lot of arm twisting to even allow the modest establishment I've got at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, so beggars couldn't be choosers. You know. So, yeah, I think once they're established, they're very hardy. As I said, I've had a top bird that lasted ten and a half years. And my aviary is not great for catching birds out because it's got a high section at the back. This bird could not be caught. It escaped everything. I was, we renovated our house ten years ago and we were away on holidays and we got robbed. And they stole all my birds except this one, <laughs> one mask. He, he could not be caught. So I came home, all the perches were on the ground. I thought, what's happened here? You know, it sort of looked like an inside job. And it probably was someone who had been involved in renovating a house. Got, but why they want to rob me, who knows? But yeah, this one mask, he was still there. Yeah. I think I took him out of your place, Richard, and we were ranking with a white, white ring. Yeah. Mm. And just to talk about Richard for a minute. Richard had an aviary which you can describe as a rabbit hutch. It was probably as big as these two tables, and it was no higher than this table. Yeah, that yeah. Right, Richard? It was, it was no higher than this. It was like a rabbit hutch. There was kikuyu growing all through the through the aviary, wasn't it? Kikuyu also. Kikuyu, but it can't Yes. So you could not. The only way you could get in was to get down on your hands and knees and crawl in. There's a colony of mask finches in this aviary with a few, um, what, was a pair of tricolour parrot finches, a few tricolours, and they bred excellently in that aviary. When Richard moved, when Richard dismantled this rabbit hutch, moved them into a conventional aviary, they couldn't handle it. <laughs> so I think they just stressed and they, and they sort of gradually fell off the perch. So, if you find something that works for you, you know, stick, stick to it. And sometimes there's no logic to what might work, but uh, yeah. I don't think we've ever had a photo of that aviary, Richard. Richard got petrified when the council was coming around to inspect his aviary, so he dismantled it very quickly. <laughs> um, personally, I would avoid too many boisterous species because I think they fall to the bottom of the pecking order, particularly in a small aviary like mine. So, and, and if they stress, that's when, you know, when you see a sick mask finch, it's not a pleasant sight. Luckily, I don't seem to have too many sick masks from over the years, but, you know, when you see one that's poorly, it's not a pretty sight. Uh, but I, because they love feeding on the floor, uh, probably can't. And even though my aviary is quite protected, it still gets water in 
and when it comes in horizontal. So after heavy rain, the soil, the sand core gets a bit wet. I do treat them with Baycox, just three mil to a litre for, for two to three days, and occasionally. Not as a regular routine, but if I see birds that are looking a bit poorly, I do treat them with moxidectin from the, from the sales table. But those are really the only medications that, uh, that I use. So, some of my gospel according to Don. And then I'll open that to questions. So I think they're a delightful addition to any collection, um, provided you've got the right set up. I think the normal masks now are selling for about $80 to $100 a pair. And, and Joe, I think when I bought them from you, I probably paid $80 a pair. So the price has not really changed for, yeah, for 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so they do need a licence, but it's not a big deal to maintain a licence. The wide end masks are more expensive. They're, there's a chap at Thunder who's over so visited. Selling them for $180 a pair. Sometimes they do no sex and probably have $20 a pair for, for doing no sex. Um, so I think it's always a great idea to keep some of your young hens. Birds that you've bred, hens that you've bred in your aviary that are acclimatised to your setup, that know your aviary, they're going to be a great foundation for your future breeding programs. So, I know I've made plenty of mistakes in the past by selling off all the young birds or not knowing after they fully coloured which were the young birds, which were the parent birds. We've probably all done that. So I'm trying to be more disciplined. I'm not always succeeding, but certainly keeping some of the young hens because I'm a bit of a softy at heart. I end up keeping a few pensioner birds. So a bird that's done well for you, I feel deserves right to sort of see how it's like in your aviary. So, but when you've only got a small aviary, if you end up with too many pensioner birds, it can be uh, a, bit, a bit tricky. Um, like, I know a lot of us look for the challenge of a new species from time to time and say they've tried something and bred it and they get rid of it and get something new. But I'm more inclined to say, look, if a species does well for you and you enjoy it, stick with it because these boom or bust cycles uh, sort of are probably not the greatest thing to maintain the quality of the species over time. Because we've got a fairly, getting a fairly narrow gene pool, you know. Like I know Sam's got some of my birds and Joe and that sort of thing. So we sort of be good to have a wider selection to, to pair up our birds from. So I'd encourage you to uh, give them a go if you've got the right, uh, right set up. Uh, don't overcrowd, like, it'll be very interesting to see my results this year. Like last year when I was very overcrowded, I think I bred, I had five pairs of masks at the start of the year and I ended up with 20 birds. So I bred 10 young uh, from five pairs, but th that was when I had a lot of other birds in the aviary. So it'll be interesting to see this year when I've been a bit more disciplined, whether the four pairs I've got with only a pair of yellow rumps and a couple of painters whether the breeding results are better. But I think last year, Joe, the breeding results generally were not flash no. across Sam? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So sometimes it's climate related, like I think rebrushing my aviary and some wet weather at the start of March was a good spur to start from breeding. So sometimes, you know, it's random what happens. Um, and finally, you know, just take time to Observe and enjoy your birds. Uh, I, can, I can watch my birds first thing in the morning because my kitchen faces my aviary. So when I'm making a cup of coffee in the morning, I watch the birds in the aviary first thing in the morning. So, good, you know? so happy, to, happy to build any questions and continue the discussion. That's all right. Brian? How, long, how long does it take the young ones to call up? Quite short, probably, certainly by three months they're fully coloured. So that's, the black bead starts to... Uh, you can see on that one, that young one, that 
it's starting to go yellow at the sort of head end, the eye end of the beak. That probably starts at about four, four or five weeks. So by two months they're pretty much, but three months they're fully coloured. So the legs start to go from black to red and the beak changes to yellow. But probably getting the full lustrous sheen takes a bit longer. It takes about six months. Yeah. 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 The lifespan? <coughs> lifespan. Well, I did have a cockbird barrier that lasts for ten and a half years. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd say good good quality healthy birds should last six, seven years. What I'd say. And they breed that whole time? Look I think they can, but I think breeding results taper off. Like cockbirds will breed. The hens taper off after three to four years, I think. Because the hens get knocked around a bit more. Like one of the things you find when I was a bit overcrowded, the hens start to get plucked by the cocks around the neck, so you get a bit of a loss of feathers around the neck. But that doesn't happen if you're not too crowded. So how many birds are actually in your area? There's 16 in the area at the moment. Yeah. So there's eight mass, there's um, two, two yellow rumps, so I sold all my yellow rumps down to one good quality bit. I tried to keep the best quality birds I got. I got a spare cock yellow rump from a guy, Forbes, Alf Watts, but for new blood because I was getting very inbred there with my yellow rumps. Uh, and I've got uh, four painters and two old double bars. Because they're, they're not a species that I think they're harder to breed, they're certainly harder to breed than long tails and black throats in my view. So, you know, results have been quite variable, whereas with long tails and that, they tend to breed. Because they're more accepting and dominant and boisterous long tails, they, they, they'll find their way higher up in the pecking order than masks. So as I said, it'll be interesting to see how my results go this year with, with letting the masks have the sort of Top, top of the top's pecking order. Okay, guys? Okay. Thank you.